question. Is it okay with you guys? Can you guys hear me in the back if I just stand over here and talk loudly, or do I need to stand in front of the mic? Somebody, or do they, uh, you guys need me there? there. Okay. Sounds good. Um, all right. So, um, all right, so my lab uh, broadly is interested in using um, comparative genomics and basically looking at genomic information across species and using evolutionary conservation and coevolution to try to infer interactions and epistasis between proteins. Um, and so I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about that today and also some experiments we've done to try to ask, like, how much can we push our computational results and how should we be interpreting our computational results? Um, okay. So, uh, first of all, I wanted to start off with just um, a really basic statement that I think we can, everyone in this room can appreciate, which is that the concept that evolutionary conservation can indicate shared function is really a central tenet of modern biology, right? So many of us follow this principle um, in our own efforts to sort of do function annotation, basically by homology. Um, and here I'm showing, I think, one of the more elegant examples for um, why we believe this is true, right? So this is um, work coming from the Horvitz lab um, that really led to his sort of 2002 Nobel Prize in figuring out how apoptotic signaling works, right? And so what he did was one of these so-called functional complementation experiments, where what you do is um, if you find some candidate gene, right? So in this case, um, they found this gene called SED9 um, in worms that they knew was associated with apoptosis. It also had strong sequence and structural similarities to this proto-oncogene BCL2, the human version. And then what they do is they say, okay, we're going to take out the worm version, we're going to put in the human version, and we're going to show that it works about the same way in worms, right? This is some of the most compelling evidence that you know, you can become convinced that BCL2 is doing the same thing as SED9, right? So here's basically the experiment. They have this little vector where they can either put the worm version of the gene or the human version of the gene. And in both cases, when you induce the gene, you, show, you see that it shows a rescue, um, an inhibition of, of apoptosis where you end up with extra cells. Okay, so this is really nice, right? This gives us kind of the basis for doing genetics in model organisms, the fact that function is conserved across these different species, um, and a strategy for recognizing genes and other genomes. Okay, but in some cases, as we're all aware, um, orthologs don't behave in the ways that we expect. And so here I'm showing an example, um, a more recent example for a kind of well-loved enzyme called dihydrofolate reductase. So dihydrofolate reductase, or DHFAR, is um, kind of a core metabolic enzyme. And if you look in E. coli and you look in humans, these two sequences have really considerable sequence homology. Um, and the two proteins have highly similar structures. And yet, whenever you put the human DHFAR into E. coli, it doesn't rescue growth, right? So here I'm showing some data. They're basically looking at relative plating efficiency, which is how well the bacteria grow. And so you can see for E. coli DHFAR, they grow very well. For Staph aureus DHFAR, another bacterial DHFAR, they also grow very well. But if you look at human DHFAR, it effectively phenocopies the full A deletion mutant. These guys don't grow at all. So despite the fact that you know, the authors checked this, this gene is expressed in bacteria, um, it has a catalytic activity in vitro that's on par with the E. coli version of the enzyme, and yet it just doesn't work, right? So there's something else about the cellular context or other required interactions that are preventing this human DHVAR from working in the E. coli context. And so um, we see this time and again that protein function can often depend on genetic or cellular context. And that is really the coupling between genes or sort of non-independence between genes can limit our ability to generalize the functional effects of mutation from one species to another, right? And so formally, um, in terms of genetics, we would call this epistasis. But really what we're talking about is just some kind of dependency, context dependence of one gene in the cellular system. Okay, so what would be nice is if we could actually go through and kind of map and predict for this gene, I think it's going to be dependent on these three others or these two others, right? Can we sort of predict the pattern of epistasis from looking at computational data? And so one approach for doing this and the approach that my lab takes is by using coevolution across species to try to map functional constraints between genes. And here um, I'm using the more limited sense of the word genes to look at really coding regions for proteins, right? And um, my lab is really interested in using two different measures uh, thus far. We're using gene syntony and gene co-occurrence. 
And basically the idea is if you look across very many genomes and you can see that there are particular genomic features that are correlated between two genes, then we might infer that they have some interaction. And so the two measures that we're, we're primarily looking at, um, so gene sentiny is basically conservation of physical proximity on the chromosome. So every time I see this red gene is the blue gene often very close by, right? And then the second is just simple binary gene presence absence. So every time I have gene A, do I also see an orthologous version of gene B? And whenever I lose gene A, am I also losing gene B, right? And so I can look at correlations and co-occurrence across species. Um, and for the purpose of this talk, we're really focusing on prokaryotic genomes, in part because there's a lot of them. And also, I think Sentiny has a more um, kind of obvious interpretation in bacteria. Um, okay, and so a lot of prior work suggests that these measures are kind of suitable indicators of functional relationships. Here I'm giving um, two such publications, though this is kind of arbitrary and almost ridiculous to just give two because I know many people have worked on these problems for many years and so obviously this is not complete and there's a large body of work around these methods showing that they can predict sort of functional interactions and relationships between these proteins. Okay, and so oftentimes this strategy is used to predict new interaction partners. So say I want to predict um, things in a physical complex, can I extrapolate to find other genes in the physical complex or suggest functional <coughs> an unannotated genes? But can we take this and also use it to identify sort of independent units of function and adaptation, right? So here are the ideas. Can we go beyond sort of just predicting new interaction partners and say that these, this group of genes forms some kind of functional unit, possibly something like a functional unit of complementation that you could transplant across species, right? Can we try to, to um, infer not only coupling, but some sort of independence between genes in our system? Okay, so what I'm going to show you guys today is actually um, a walk through how we're doing our Sentinel calculations. And then we're going to apply these methods to a metabolic pathway called folate metabolism. And then I'll show you some experiments indicating that, in fact, there are independent units of function kind of embedded within these metabolic pathways. Okay, so our Sentinel measurements um, basically. Uh, what we start off with is defining a measure of significance in a single genome, right? So if we see two genes in proximity in one genome, can we assign a p-value to that? Okay, and so what we do is we take our two genes, gene I and gene J, and then we calculate some distance between them in base pairs, right? This distance Dij. And then we take that distance and we normalize it by the length of the chromosome divided by two. And the reason why we're dividing it by two is because bacteria have um, circular chromosomes, right? So the furthest apart these two genes can be is if they're at opposite sides of this circle. So we should see that Xij is equal to one when these things are on opposing sides and then it's much less whenever um, they're closer together. So the convenient thing about doing the normalization in this way, right, is that now this value Xij effectively com becomes a p-value. So the value Xij ranges from zero to one, and what it's describing is what is the probability that I should see these two genes at this distance or less, given a null model where the genes are uniformly distributed. So it's important to say that here we're taking a, a uniform null model where the genes are just uniformly distributed along the chromosome. Probably not so good for eukaryotes, but um, as I'll show you in a minute, I think it's quite reasonable for prokaryotic genomes. Okay, so we get a measure of proximity for a pair of genes in a single genome, but now what we want to do is go and look across many thousands of different organisms. And so we can ask, now what is the kind of um, probability of seeing these two genes in proximity across an ensemble of genomes, right? So we have genomes from 1 to M, where M is usually order about 1,000. Um, and then what we're going to do is we're going to assign some cutoff distance P star. And so this cutoff distance is, um, we've shown now actually that you can change this quite a bit without um, perturbing the results, but typically we use a value around 30 KB. And so if we take this distance 30 KB, we can look for how often these two genes occur in proximity. And so effectively we can just count. So we can say like here we see this four times. And then we can ask, what is the significance of seeing these genes in proximity four times out of M trials? And we're calculating this using a standard binomial distribution. So effectively, we're just treating this like a coin toss problem, right? We're asking like if you flip a coin 100 times and you get 20 heads, how surprised should you be? Except here our trials are the number of genomes, and then K is the number of um, hits in terms of distance. And then P stars are our probability of seeing these two genes at a distance, which comes from this. 
OK, so this gives us our measure of significance across all of these genomes. And one thing to see is that overall, our null model seems pretty reasonable. And so this isn't totally obvious, right? We're assuming two things. We're assuming a uniform distribution of genes along the chromosome. And then we're also treating these things like independent trials. So implicit in using the binomial distribution, right, we're taking these as kind of Bernoulli samples or like uh, samples out of a hat, right? Um, but we know that they're actually sampled along some evolutionary tree. And, um, but the interesting thing is that we actually find that the bulk of our data um, fits to our null model, right? So here what we're showing is the distribution of gene pairs on the y-axis. And then minus log pi, so this is our significance value here. So these are pairs that are um, less significant. These are pairs that are more significant. And what you can see is the black line is the actual data. And then the blue is where we take these genomes and we just randomize the positions of all the genes horizontally, so we shuffle them. And what you can see is this is a log log plot. So the vast majority of the genes actually behave like this random null model, right? And then we get a tail of genes that appear to do something quite different. And these are the pairs that become um, interesting. And then there's one last step in these calculations, which is that we take this p-value attain, obtained from the binomial distribution function, and we actually rescale it to a callback Leibler relative entropy, OK? And all we're doing here is we're taking these um, sort of numbers of um, observations, and we're converting them into frequencies. And the reason why we do this is because this measure depends on the number of gen genomes that we've sampled, whereas in the limit of large M, this callback Leibler um, relative entropy is sort of independent to the number of samples. So it gives us a, a more independent measure that we can use. And so this is what I'll show um, in the rest of the talk. OK, so that's our basic measure of synteny. And then now what we're going to do is we're going to start off and we're just going to apply this to very small and kind of well-characterized, well-studied pathway. Um, and so this is basically central folate metabolism. And this is a collection of 13 enzymes that catalyze the reactions necessary for synthesizing purine nucleotides, thymidine, and a few amino acids, right? And so this is just a standard metabolic pathway diagram. We have our enzyme names in black and then blue are the substrates and products, so all the small molecule intermediates. And the reason why my lab is interested in this pathway um, is for a few things. One, it's very well conserved in central metabolism, meaning that we have uh, good statistics across bacteria. It's well studied, so there's a lot of context to interpret our data. Um, and then finally, these two things are related more to experimental aspects. We know that mutations in these genes directly impact cellular growth, so you really need this pathway for cells to grow and divide. So it means we have a very um, experimentally measurable output of function in the system. And then finally, this pathway is a common target of antibiotics and chemotherapeutics, um, which means that we have a number of nice kind of small molecule handles that we can use to um, disturb or um, uh, perturb this pathway. OK, so this is our kind of biochemical representation of the pathway. And we can ask, what does this pathway look like if we view it instead through these evolutionary kind of lens, right? So this is, um, yeah, we have our biochemical map here. And then here what I'm showing is the pattern of coupling seen either by synteny or by gene co-occurrence, right? And so what this is, is we have a little two-dimensional matrix where we've got enzymes by enzymes, and then the genomes here are at right. Um, and uh, so it's a square symmetric matrix. And the color coding is such that purple indicates a, a, a less significant um, observation, and yellow indicates a high degree of coupling. And so um, one thing you can notice, first of all, is that these two matrices, at least in the case of this pathway, actually seem to be reporting um, similar information. And so um, I'm going to focus on uh, the synteny matrix to point out a few um, features going forward. So in the case of gene synteny, um, the first thing that we see, we see some coupling between genes that are physically interacting, right? And so this was um, kind of reassuring that our method is working in the way that we expect it to. So we see interactions between GCPH, P, and T, um, which are part of a four-protein macromolecular complex called the glycine decarboxylase complex. There's a fourth gene called LPD that we don't pick up that's part of the complex. And interestingly, LPD is also part of two other physical complexes in the cell. So we think maybe that gene is kind of special and that it's constrained to work with multiple other complexes. So we definitely see physical complexes. 
But then we also see some other things. So we also see coevolution or syntenic relationships between um, genes that are catalyzing consecutive reactions, right? So we see a high degree of coupling between DHFR and TYMS here, these two enzymes. And we also see a high degree of coupling between methionine synthase and methionine tetrahydrofolate reductase, these two enzymes here, right? So that it kind of makes sense, right, that maybe you would see some evolutionary coupling between things that do um, sequential reactions, right? They're certainly proximal on this metabolic network, but obviously um, biochemical proximity isn't a sufficient criteria for coupling because there's many genes on here that are sequential that we don't see um, synteny or gene presence absence signatures for, right? We could certainly not reconstruct this graph using the data that we have in this graph, right? They're two very different representations. So there appears to be something potentially kind of special about these two pairs. Um, so overall, right, we get this representation from Synteny that appears somewhat sparse and modular, right? We have a subset of genes that are really strongly coupled to each other, but are relatively decoupled from the rest of the pathway. And this is really um, kind of different from other views, right? So for example, here I'm showing um, a similar matrix that we've generated using the string database scores, right? So string database has um, an aggregate confidence prediction score where now you're combining information from synteny, co-occurrence, text mining, um, experiments on protein-protein interactions, sort of large-scale yeast to hybrid studies, right? And they produce an aggregate score. And that aggregate score is really designed to kind of recapitulate the interaction seen in KEG. And so you can see that, for example, string database is very successful at this, right? They're detecting um, all of the enzymes within this metabolic pathway, which is a shared KEG metabolic pathway, come up as being kind of high confidence, which is very different from the representation you get from um, Synteny alone. So, okay, so then we started to ask, think about this. And so the question is, is the absence of evidence that we're seeing in this graph, right, the fact that we see that DHFAR and TYMS co-evolve with each other and not with the rest of the pathway, is that that we're just missing something? Like, are there things that Synteny is missing that we're not picking up? Or um, does it really imply that there's evidence for absence, that they're really sort of acting independently within the context of this larger metabolic pathway? And so the question is, are the DHFR and TYMS pair um, sort of coupled to each other, but decoupled from the remainder of the pathway, right? And you can notice that there's a few other, like there's the methionine synthase MTHFR module on here as well. Um, and we're really choosing to focus on the DHFR TYMS pair because they're mo the most um, strongly coupled pair uh, in this analysis. Okay, so we wanted to check this. And so we're going to do some experiments to look at their kind of coupling to each other and decoupling from the rest of the pathway. So the first thing that we did was to make some quantitative measurements of genetic epistasis. And my labs developed a platform for doing this in a fairly high throughput way with next generation sequencing. So what we do is we take a knockout strain of E. coli where we've deleted the endogenous copies of DHFR and thymidylate synthase. And then we can put those two enzymes back in on a plasmid. And on that plasmid, we include these five base pair barcodes. And so by sequencing this barcoded region, we can know with a short read the identity of our DHFAR mutant and which thymidylate synthase mutant or TYMS mutant it's paired with, right? So we have this barcoded library of mutations in DHFR and mutations in TYMS. And then we can take this library, mix it together, and we can grow it in a device called a turbidistat. So what a turbidistat is, is a device for continuous culture, where effectively you're growing these cells in this little um, 15 milliliter vial, um, shown here, right? And what we're doing is we're sensing the optical density of that culture, and then we're continually adding in fresh media. So once they hit a target optical density, we pump in fresh media, and what that does is allow us to keep these cells in exponential phase growth for long periods of time and make sure that we have a really consistent and well-controlled environment for our experiment. And then what we can do is now we can quantify relative growth rates by next generation sequencing. So what we do is over the course of about 12 to 24 hours, we take out time points, and then we just sequence to ask, what is the frequency of each allele over time, right? So basically this amounts to a fancy counting experiment where we're just counting the members of our population. And in fact, what we can do is we can take these data and we can compute a normalized relative frequency where we're looking at the number of mutants relative to the number of wild type and we normalize to that, that to their frequency at t equals zero. 
Okay, so you can see that if you have like a less fit allele, like this red line, it decreases over time. If you have a more fit allele, like the blue line, then it increases a little bit over time. Okay, so we can get growth rates for all of these mutants. And then now, if we've actually uh, structured our mutant population properly, then we can get out epistasis between these mutations, right? So we can look at the effect of mutating, for example, gene A on the top line on its own. So um, mutating, say, DHFR on its own, and then making that same mutation in the background of a mutation in gene B, right? And so then the question becomes, is mutating gene A on its own have the same effect or a different effect than we would have seen mutating it in the background of gene B? And so effectively, if those two numbers are the same, then we would say these have zero epistasis. And if we see that the effect of gene A depends on the background of gene B, then we know we have some epistasis or coupling there. Okay, so first of all, um, just the DHFR mutants. So what I'm going to do is just walk you through the data. Um, the red points are 10 different DHFR point mutants, and we measure their growth rates in the background of either the wild type TYMS or TYMS R166Q, which is catalytically inactive. And so the first thing we can show, so these red points are different DHFR mutants, and they're variants that we characterize in the laboratory, so we know their catalytic activities. And we see that um, you know, at first, basically, you can reduce the catalytic activity DHFR and the cell still grows okay, but then at some point the growth rate starts to really tank as DHFR activity decreases. And that makes sense, right? It's a core metabolic enzyme. And then we can ask, what's the effect of now mutating TYMS? So this is the second enzyme in our module, and you can see that mutating TYMS also decreases the growth rate. And importantly, we're doing these experiments um, in the presence of a little bit of thymidine. So thymidine is the product of TYMS. If you remove thymidine from the media, then this R166Q mutant is totally dead, and this becomes a very boring experiment. So you can see a fitness cost for TYMS. And then now you can look at the effect of all the DHFAR mutants in the background of TYMS. And so what we see is something interesting, where um, when you look at the left side of this graph, now you find that mutations that have a low, low activity DHFAR are buffered by having this loss of function in TYMS, right? So it seems like it's better if you have a low activity DHFAR to be matched with a low activity TYMS than it is to be matched with a, um, the native version of the TYMS gene. And in fact, we can repeat this experiment in high thymidine, so a concentration of thymidine where the TYMS gene is um, really sort of not needed, and you can see that this effect becomes even more extreme, and you can rescue the effect of knocking out DHFAR almost entirely, um, up to some level, just by removing the TYMS gene. Okay, so DHFR and TYMS are clearly epistatic, um, and this is consistent with their coevolution, right? So we can see this coevolution signature by syntony and by co-occurrence, um, and that seems to be reflected in the fact that they're epistatically coupled in this way where the activity of one, kind of um, the optimal activity of one depends on the optimal activity of the other. And um, I'll just spend a moment on this slide, but we've now figured out a little bit about the mechanism of this. In fact, it turns out that the intermediate shared by DHFAR and TYMS is um, detrimental if it accumulates, right? So uh, DHF, the shared intermediate, if it accumulates in the cell, has an inhibitory effect on growth. And so in fact, what we can see is that when you have these low activity DHFR mutants, they accumulate DHF in the cell, that's this patch here, and they deplete all of these reduced folate intermediates. So these intermediates here deplete, and this guy accumulates. And then if you also make the TYMS knockout, then you can restore metabolic balance. So in this case now, um, you have less DHF accumulation and um, less depletion of these reduced folates. So it really seems that the coupling between these two genes is kind of mediated by this need to um, conserve flux in this metabolic pathway. Okay, so we see that these two genes have some epistatic coupling through a shared metabolite. And it suggests that constraints on metabolic flux can drive coevolution, and it's consistent with the notion that genes and syntony are often co-expressed, right? So one mechanism to make sure you have similar levels of DHFAR and TYMS might be to just put them close by on the chromosome, and then you make similar amounts. But are they really decoupled from the remainder of the pathway, right? Are they really acting as some kind of functional unit? And so to test this, what we decided to do is a genome-wide second site suppressor screen. And so here the idea is what we want to do is we want to perturb function for one of the two genes in our module. So we're going to inhibit DHFR with a drug called trimethoprim. We're going to ask them to evolve resistance, and then we're going to do whole genome sequencing to see what adapts, right? <coughs> 
And so the question is, do we see adaptation just in the DHFR gene itself? Do we see adaptation in the DHFR TYMS pair? Do we see adaptation more broadly over the pathway? Or maybe we get mutations in some other enzymes um, elsewhere in metabolism or elsewhere in the cell that we didn't even anticipate. Okay, so um, we do this, this experiment using a device called the Morbidistat. And what the Morbidistat is, is it's a device for um, basically evolving uh, antibiotic resistance or resistance to some kind of toxin. And the way it works is that again, we're growing our cells in these little 15 mil vials, as, as you see at the left. And then what we do is we do periodic um, dilutions with media, like you would do in a chemostat. So basically you have your cells, and then they, um, sorry, the la la my laser pointer is not working very well, but you can see they sort of periodically have these um, phases of growth and then dilution, and then growth and then dilution. And what happens is once they hit a target optical density, instead of diluting with fresh media, we dilute them with a media that has drug added to it, right? And so you add in that drug, and then the cells start to die back off. And so the color coding is the amount of drug that's added in the media. So yellow indicates really high concentrations of drug. And so you can see once the drug gets to a certain concentration, the cells die off, and then we add in fresh media again. And by repeating this over long times, we can push them to evolve a lot of resistance. Um, so we built two of them in the laboratory now. Uh, this is what they look like. So basically we have these arrays of about 15 different vials so we can run mini replicates in parallel. Um, and then they're built inside of an incubator for temperature control. Okay, so here's what the experiment looks like. We run this experiment over the course of about 15 days. Um, and again, these trajectories are color coded by the antibiotic concentration. So you can see we get these phases where the cells um, will grow up and then they're hit with drug and then they get diluted back down or then they die off. And this occurs over and over again. Each day we actually um, take a subset of the population out and restart the vial. Um, and you can see by the color coding that they are indeed evolving really high levels of trimethoprim resistance. In fact, we stop the experiment at the end because they're resistant to a level of drug that we cannot actually physically dissolve anymore in the media. Um, so we take these three trajectories, and then at the end, we isolate colonies, and we do whole genome sequencing for 10 isolates from each population. Okay, so we can then ask, where does the adaptation take place? And so here I'm showing a little snapshot of our whole genome sequencing data. So what it looks like is we have 10 different isolates um, from each uh, condition. So these are the data for one condition, five micrograms from L-thymidine. And we have these 10 different colonies, and then we can look at the pattern of mutations um, along the chromosome. And then if we look at this across all three conditions, then we start to see some repeated patterns emerging, okay? So in all three of our conditions, we see that Thi A, the gene for thymidylate synthase, or TYMS, is mutated. In the majority of cases, we also see mutations in full A, the gene encoding DHFR. And then we see a smattering of mutations elsewhere in the genome, right? And so one thing that was interesting is that we always see mutations in Thi A, but that's not even the gene that we're targeting with the drug. In fact, the gene that we're targeting with drug is DHFR, but obviously it seems like one way to evolve resistance is just my acquiring a mutation in the Thi A gene. And in fact, my graduate student who did this experiment, I think is one of the luckiest graduate students ever, because one of the things that he found was that in one of these strains, we get a mutation in DHFR, we get a mutation in TYMS, and then we don't see any other mutations in the genome, suggesting that this is a sufficient pair to actually evolve resistance to trimethoprim. Um, but to come more convinced of this, um, what we did was to go through and take combinations of these DHFR and TYMS mutations um, and take them and engineer them into a clean genetic background. And what we can see, so these um, strains R2, R3, and R4 each have a DHFR and TYMS mutation isolated from our experiments in a clean background, and those all have resistance levels on par with these fully evolved strains, suggesting that those are the sufficient pair to acquire resistance. Okay, so overall, these data seem to suggest that DHFR and TYMS, they are coupled to each other, and they seem to be acting like an adaptive unit. So they adapt together in response to the addition of drug. Um, and it really kind of suggests that, again, this little pair is somehow special in the context of the overall metabolic pathway. And then finally, just to come back to the problem that I set up in the very beginning, this question of functional complementation, right? 
Um, so here what I want to show is something that's intriguing. It's a kind of new experimental result that we need to do more work on. Um, but I wanted to show it because I think it gives you a hint of the kinds of experiments we'd really like to be doing. Um, which is we set up this idea that we've seen um, in the literature that taking DHFAR from other species and putting it back into E. coli um, often doesn't rescue growth, right? So then the question is, if DHFAR and TYMS really represent some kind of functional unit, can we take them and transplant them as a pair and rescue growth with more um, higher probability than taking DHFAR on its own? And so what these data are is they're, um, we've taken the DHFR gene and the TYMS gene and we fused them together. So they're pro producing them as a covalently linked protein to ensure that they're present at stoichiometric quantities. And then um, these are drop, drop spot assays. So what you can see is basically it's a report of how efficiently the E. coli are growing um, on agar plates. And what we have under the U columns is it's an unmatched version of our gene pair where we have the DHFR is taken from a particular species, so in this case, Klebsiella pneumoniae, but it's matched with the TYMS from E. coli. And then now we can show if we take this unmatched pair and we now match it with the TYMS also from Klebsiella pneumoniae, then in this case, we get a nice rescue. And so we see a number of pairs where actually by matching it with its own TYMS, we see rescue of growth. A few cases where you start to see some growth, and then a bunch of cases where it still doesn't quite work yet, which suggests there might be some other forces at play. And these are data that we still need to understand better. Um, but it indicates the fact that potentially by matching these two genes, you can rescue some degree of growth. So, okay, so overall, um, basically we see that these two enzymes are really um, an evolutionary unit by gene synteny in the analysis of all of these prokaryotic genomes. We see that they're epistatically coupled to each other through metabolite. So we can see that these kind of metabolic constraints can actually result in, in coevolution across species. And they seem to represent an adaptive unit where gene variation in one gene can buffer or suppress variation in the other. And then finally, we're testing these two enzymes as a unit of functional complementation. So maybe this is the unit that you can actually transplant or swap out um, across species. And so overall, I think it suggests these metabolic pathways, in fact, that this view um, is actually quite informative, and that instead of viewing all of folate metabolism as being this highly interconnected network, that embedded within this metabolic pathway, we have some subsets of genes that are more highly coupled to each other and more highly interdependent, but are somehow isolated from the rest of the metabolic structure. And so, um, you know, but what about this, right? So I've spent the last 30, 35 minutes telling you guys about one particular gene pair that has this very strong statistical signature that we've studied very carefully, um, but now can we apply this more generally? Um, and so now we've done genome-wide uh, analysis of, of synteny and co-occurrence to try to look for more of these types of um, modules that we can experimentally test. And I think one thing um, that uh, that seems really important to me is that we need new types of experiments that can indicate not only coupling but actually independence between genes. So oftentimes when we do these coevolutionary analyses, we go and we compare them to things like protein-protein interaction databases, right? But obviously those are going to be missing some of the data because here we can see coevolution between things that aren't physically binding but do have some kind of metabolic interaction. We can go and compare to things like CAG, but that's also, again, going to be telling us about interactions between things, not so much independence, right? And so I think what we really need is sort of measurements of epistasis and things like these transplant and forward evolution experiments that can begin to tell us about um, not only kind of the connections here, but the amount of modularity that we see um, in these metabolic pathways overall. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank my lab. Um, Chris Engel and Andrew Schober, in particular, um, did the majority of experiments that I showed you guys today. The metabolomics data were collected by June Park and Lee Chen in Josh Rabinowitz's lab. And um, Olivier Revoir and Yvonne Junier have been my long-term collaborators um, and really worked on the Centony calculations. Um, and with that, I would welcome any questions. So suppose that this, I mean, when you were thinking in terms of genes, mm -hmm. then we have the problem of 
there are many of these enzymes that are uh, made up of many subunits, mm -hmm. uh, and they are so in, in the same. This is the gene for neuroanalysis, or do you deal with the different subunits in different ways? Yeah, so, so we take everything within a, um, a, like a coding region is considering that one protein or one gene, right? So we certainly don't isolate them by kind of catalytic domains yet. Um, the relationship to operons, I think, is very interesting. Um, so in this case, in this Centony analysis, what we find is things that are actually kind of super operonic. So they often encapsulate operons, but then extend the boundaries, and sometimes, in some cases, by a considerable amount. And then sometimes they can include um, kind of multiple operons within one of these Centony segments. Um, and so to me, that suggests that potentially you could get some regulation that's outside the scale of operons, um, perhaps by uh, kind of changing the supercoiling structure of DNA or other kind of chromosomal parameters that could you, you could get extra regulation that's not just at the operon level. Yeah. Yeah. Have you generalized your synthesis calculations to deal with gene duplications with parallels? Yes. So um, in the case of gene duplications and paralogs, um, I believe what we do right now is, is a little bit clunky, but we just take kind of the average distance between the two things um, when we're comparing uh, pairwise to other things. But um, I think we need to do something better in the case of gene duplications and paralogs. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess for me, when I looked at your the first, the basis for the Sydney calculation, it's that you have this uniform distribution. I think at really high distances, that's right. But related to the first question about operons, there are lots of things that generate short distances in genomes that are actually related to keeping forks from bumping into uh, transcription in eukaryotes and in bacteria. I think you know, there's lots of things about horizontal gene transfer and things like that that generate these close distances. So I would guess that the, the, that null model is correct at high distances, but at low distances, it's overestimating uh, significance. But then when you show your data, it's very nice and sparse. So you know, have you thought about ways of maybe accounting for the, the direction of the transcription or, or sort of splitting that callback library divergence into like different same terms? Di di different, you know, same direction versus not? Yeah. You know, there's a multi variate version of that. Um, so, okay, so I think that um, I definitely agree with you that there's a lot of factors at short distances that can influence gene positioning. But I think some of those are precisely the kinds of things that we're trying to look for, even at these shorter distances, what kind of deviations do we get from a, a, a uniform model? And so we have looked a little bit at um, basically position of genes. And the thing that we've been finding is that within these synteny segments, that the two genes are, um, in some ways this is maybe unsurprising, that the two genes are often going in the same direction or in imposing directions, but we very rarely see, see things that are going sort of head on, right? So I think that's consistent with the idea that these things within the synteny segments are um, being oriented in ways to um, potentially like promote co-regulation of the unit or avoid collisions between the, the genes that are arranged in these segments, yeah. if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So showing how it sort of subdivides the operon in the way that you did is, is really interesting. So maybe you know, just add the, the diagram. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it becomes more clear. Yeah, because we definitely we see both cases. We see cases where you subdivide operons into smaller groups, and then we also see cases where you um, kind of aggregate genes that are within in a few different operons into a single group, depending on position. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, yeah, yeah. For a couple yeah. Of so, when you see the strongly coupled um, genes like the HFR and some of like the synthase here, uh, have you looked uh, for structural evidence of, of having a complex? Because actually, <laughs> I, I just looked. Yeah. Uh, if you can, I was actually. There, there are fused, there, right? There are, there are a few complexes. So, this can uh, seriously strengthen your, um, you know, I mean, this does. I mean, and I, I didn't see finding any in prokaryotes, but at least in, in, in uh, eukaryotes, uh, they are coupled. Yeah. And the interesting thing that you said that, you know, one from one organism doesn't rescue another, that actually makes them 
efficient drug targets. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think that does make them interesting as drug targets. Um, and so, yeah, so you're right. So these things occur actually a fusion, a fusion in um, protozoa and a handful of plants, but they're not fused, for example, in, in most higher eukaryotes like us, and they're not fused in bacteria. It's interesting if you look at the complexes where they're fused, the linkers between them range anywhere from like 15 to something like hundreds of amino acids, and they appear to be. Um, the relative orientation of these things, at least in the crystal structures, is very diverse. So I'm kind of wondering if the actual physical, it, it's not so necessarily that they're forming like a really rigid physical complex as much as it's just a tethering mechanism to make sure they're present in similar so quantities. So fusion in eukaryotes, but does that mean they do not form an unfused complex in prokaryotes as well? Actually, it strengthens that. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's possible. I mean, people have, have kind of looked for it and not seen it yet, but we're planning to also look for it just to check. <laughs> One last very quick question. I'm sorry, but we will let other questions uh, come up. So following up on Ido's question, the question on operon structure and everything, in addition to co-occurrence and synteny, um, do the um, coupled enzymes show any evidence of greater co-regulation than the rest of the um, folate map, and do they show any signs of co-evolution? Yes, OK, so that's a good question. So. Um, DHFR and TYMS do show some evidence of being co-regulated in E. coli, so they're usually present in sort of stoichiometric amounts over a diversity of different environmental conditions. Someone did a screen in like 300 different conditions of expression levels, and they do seem to be correlated in that. Um, we are starting to look for sequence level co-evolution, just to see if we see anything. Um, I will say that uh, using the approach that we started with, we do see coevolution between the two enzymes, which looked very tantalizing. But then I also took DHFR and I fused it to a flagellar gene and saw coevolution. So I'm, I, I think we need to do more work to resolve what's real and what's coming from like phylogeny and things like this. Yeah. All right. So thank you very much, Kim. Let's